what's important at the end of the day. And for me, at the end of the day, it's spirituality that reminds us of our values, that keeps us focused and centered. You're listening to the Building a Coaching Culture podcast. If you need to compete and win in the 21st century labor market as an employer of choice, this podcast is for you. Each week, we share leadership development, coaching, and culture development insights from leading experts who are developing world-class cultures in their own organizations. And now, here's your host, J.R. Flatter. Hey, welcome back, everybody. J.R. Flatter here with my co-host, Lucas. Hello, good morning. And today, we have a very distinguished guest, Dinesh Singh, who is right now in Sydney, Australia. But a bit of a world traveler. Thanks for being here. It's always great to have our friends from Australia. And just point out to everybody, it's 11 o'clock at night where you are. Actually, I have an event in Japan at midnight tonight. So you and I are going to be on opposite ends of the, of the <laughs> okay. spectrum. You're midnight, your time for us, and I'm going to be midnight for them. All right, just uh, refresh everybody's memory and, and let you know, Dinesh, we're talking to leaders of complex organizations who you're very familiar with as a non-executive director. We're trying to compete and succeed in this 21st century global labor market. The reason you and I know each other is because of that global labor market. And so Lucas and I work trying to create a coaching culture, which you know a good bit about as well. So I'm going to pass it over to you, and I want you to tell us all about yourself, and don't be humble. I know you tend to be humble, so... Yeah, it's a difficult one. Uh, we try to be humble. That's what we taught from a very young age. So thank you. I'm really delighted to be here. Thanks for the opportunity. Honored to be on this podcast with the two of you. I guess a bit of background about myself. Identity is a very important aspect about who I am. I am a third generation South African Indian. Thought I'd just put that out there. So uh, the reason why I say that is, you know, my people uh, about 150 years ago were brought over in the ships, in the slave ships, over from India. I'm from, originate from the south of India, and uh, they were brought over to work in the sugarcane plantations in South Africa for the farmers back then. So that's my history. You know, it's really something that's very important to me. It's very much a part of my roots. So uh, identity is absolutely critical because we were somewhat of a lost generation. As much as I'm Indian, I can be un-Indian at times because of the fact that I was, you know, third generation born in South Africa and I'm very South African by the same token. And 16 years ago, I had the good fortune of moving over to Australia, the lucky country. I'm very happy to be here. I came over working for the Prudential Regulator, that's the Banking and Financial Services Regulator of Australia. So I was uh, fully sponsored by that organization. And uh, that's after working for about 17 years in the banking industry in South Africa. So again, quite a lot of uh, you know corporate experience over the years, about 30 plus years working at large corporates, multinationals. And I was raised, you know, like I said, in a little farming town, in a rural town of South Africa, in a sugarcane plantation, you know. So so for me, you know, coming through the journey that I've had over the years and moving over to Australia, starting at such a big organization, working at such a, you know, illustrious organization like the banking regulator for Australia was quite a success for me back then. I think I mentioned to you previously, JR, I grew up in apartheid South Africa. If you recall, you know, apartheid was a segregation of people of color. You know, various people of color, we lived in a segregated manner. And for me, growing up in the latter part of that, uh, before Nelson Mandela was freed from from prison, I was in my uh, 15 years old at that time, just before then. And so my teenage years was a very disrupted period in my life because I was part of that resistance, that struggle to free Nelson Mandela. And as young as I was, you know, I was part of all the protests and all of the things that happened at that point in in our history. 
And uh, one of the things I learned growing up through that was always uh, challenge the status quo, you know, challenge all of uh, the injustices and the oppression that from that period. And I have a strong sense of purpose and justice. And everything that I do in in how I lead, in how, what I expect of my leaders, is driven by that. So that's just something that's quite important for me. Recently, after about 33 years, I have had a very good career. You know, over that period, I worked for the best of organizations. You know, given my background, I am a very driven person. So I'm always focused on, you know, outcomes, achievement. I want to be the best. I want to be up there with everyone else. I want to be seen as equal. I went on a, a leadership coaching uh, course myself. About 10 years ago, I was um, partnered with Helen Wiseman, who you know as well. She's an excellent coach. And that was my entry into, into Australia at that point in time. And coaching for me at that point was quite a pivotal moment in my career. Because it just opened my mind to the possibilities. It challenged my thinking, my frame of thinking, and it helped me determine the next 10 years. So the next 10 years from that coaching experience was my thriving years. You know, I actually surpassed and exceeded all the expectations that I even wanted out of my 10 years. And so I found myself last year thinking, where to next? You know, I've got to the level that I wanted. I actually had overachieved at that point in time. <laughs> and I wasn't really enjoying it, to be honest. I got to the, the title I wanted. I got to the salary uh, more than what I expected I would ever earn in my lifetime. And there was just something that was missing. And I then re-engaged uh, my coach from the past, being Helen. And I embarked on a new journey to basically look at what the next 10 years is going to be for me. And I did the most craziest thing. And, and Helen says, it's not crazy. It's really being bold and being courageous. And I resigned from what I knew. So I left my 30 plus year sort of profession without a job, without something to go, go to. And a year later, I'm really excited about the possibilities. You know, I'm earning money. I've had a number of different customers. So I've run a consulting business and I'm a non-executive director. So today I've got made an offer for a third directorship as well. So, you know, that was another win for me. Really, my current position is I run my consultancy. I continue to do my risk governance and compliance work. And I go around helping organizations for purpose organizations that are aligned with my values and I help them be the best they can be. So grow their business in a very sustainable, in a very safe manner. And I use data. I use a data-driven approach to achieve that outcome. So that's where I am in my current career. I'm really loving it. I'm training to be a coach as well. And it's really been quite a momentous moment in my life. Well, wow, there's a ton there, a ton of richness there. Uh, thanks for all of that. You know, we have here in America, we have our own history similar to what you were describing for the third generation uh, and how that all started. And I suspect a lot of Americans, not negatively, but just I suspect that they have no idea that that, that occurred between India and South Africa. So I've got my notes here and I've got you in front of me and I've got your bio over here to my left. There's tons of richness in your life. And I can't believe you said two or three times, my 30 year career. I'm thinking she must've started when she was 12. So I love this idea of the, the next 10 years because Lucas and I talk about the 30 year vision a lot. And when you initially ask someone, the younger they are, the harder it is. Look 30 years into the future. I was doing that this morning on a bicycle asking myself, you know, what does that look like? Even at my age, I don't know if Helen worked with you. We, lo we all love Helen and everybody who listens to this podcast knows and loves Helen. How do you get started on that, creating that 10-year vision? So there's this concept of uh, discover. So discover and become. So I went through that sort of discovery process of identifying my strengths, my Clifton strengths. And uh, I was quite intrigued by what I found. So 
10 years ago when I worked with Helen, I was a very different person. I had different, very different uh, Clifton strengths. And that helped me for that period of time. And now I have another, you know, different set of Clifton strengths. And again, part of that discovery process, I have a vision board, you know, of what I like to do, what I want to do. And that's helping me work through in a very logical, iterative manner around what my next steps are. So, like JR said, there's a lot in your background that kind of jumped out at me. And it, it's, like he said, rich with detail and, and things that I'm interested in learning about. Um, so, you started with saying identity is very important to me. We do think about identity a lot in, in terms of how corporations and organizations are kind of encouraging people to be themselves. And especially, Asking somebody that's experienced like overt segregation, do you feel that, you know, these large corporations or organizations that you've worked with have kind of embraced your identity and allowed you to be yourself in that way? They probably didn't have a choice in the matter. <laughs> so I, I guess, um, you know, and it's a very interesting point, you know, diversity and inclusion is such an, a topical thing, you know, for many years people have been talking about it. I don't know that people have quite cracked it yet, right? So um, for me, I am who I am. Take it or leave it. And it's simply because of the learnings of my guru, uh, Nelson Mandela. You know, that's innate. It's built into me. It's part of my DNA. Whereas I do know a lot of people that do change around the circumstances and the environment in which they are. And it's sad because, you know, that's you got to fake it till you make it, they say. Unfortunately, that doesn't allow people to be authentic, their true authentic self. So identity is absolutely crucial. It helps me stay authentic. It helps me remember my roots, right? It helps me sort of define my values and align my values. So, and I think everyone, wherever you come from, you know, there's migration and globalization is a big thing at the moment, right? It'll continue to become a big thing. And I think people need to be comfortable in their own skin. Organizations like are they are speaking, talking the talk. They need to start walking the walk. I think it's up to us, people like myself, to educate people. You know, from the day I walked into this country, into Australia, which is amazing. You know, it's a great country to be in, but it's a journey, it's learning for everyone. You know, as the country evolves with, with migration and the changing landscape in the demographics. And Australia is learning, you know, it's up to us, you know, people like myself and migrants to teach and to educate about culture, what's important to us, you know, and about our authentic self, basically. Thank you for that. Now, I mean, that level of, you know, it's up to me and not the, you know, existing prevalent culture to understand it just out the, off the gate. So that's interesting. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for that. And and I think as as I think of, you know, from a CEO chair and a chairman's chair, you know, what are the core values of my organization? And any organization that might be listening or watching, and not to split the academic hair too finely, but the more I think about this and, and talk to people such as yourself, you need to keep that list pretty sharp and clear and then let everything else go. Right? The way you wear your hair, the way you speak, the way you dress. Is that really existential to the company? And should it even be on the list? I'd love to hear you talk about that. How do you help identify those existential few things that we all agree on and then let everything else go? Yeah, it's a very good point. It's a, it's a very, you know, um, interesting sort of perspective. I guess, to your point, your core values have to be certain, you know, a number of things like your code of conduct. It doesn't matter. Whatever sort of walks of life you come from, there's certain minimum requirements everyone needs to sort of comply with. Your values, there's certain things about how you treat the customer, how you design products, customer experience, those sorts of things, complying with the law. Those are your absolute on the list things. So I agree with you from that perspective. And then everything on the peripheral, everything that allows people to be their authentic self, allows psychological safety, 
should be allowed to, you know, just be, I suppose, you know. And I think there's a lot of uh, campaigns, there's a lot of initiatives across a number of, you know, LGBT. TQI, you know, cultural diversity, there's all sorts of, you know, ageism, there's all sorts of uh, levels of diversity that companies are promoting to sort of drive home the awareness. But it sort of needs to also come from each of us, you know, each of us are citizens of the world. We all need to bring it from within, I suppose, and allow each person to be, you know. So I think it's just allowing people to be, you know, that's the the crux of it all. And I think the, the, the real heart and soul of what you're saying is the two can coexist. It's not an either or. Absolutely. And you can be supremely profitable and inclusive at the same time. Totally, totally. You had mentioned that you're working with um, four purpose organizations. Is that synonymous with nonprofit and and if so, um, what's that distinction? What is like the for purpose nomenclature or label? How is that distinctive from saying nonprofit, I guess? Yeah, it's an interesting point because, you know, I work for banks and financial services. They are for purpose. You know, they help people buy homes, they help people manage their financial well being. So there's definitely for purpose in that in corporate as well. So, yes, to your point, I help for purpose and not-for-profit. So I'm very particular about who I work with. I select, I choose who I want to work with. And if I see that there is no, you know, the purpose is not aligned with my, what I view as for purpose, I then don't pursue that opportunity. So I think for me, you know, it's very clear on that distinction. When people in the States are choosing to work with someone, it's... um it's almost this idea that the profit will result in in positive social outcomes and you know positive impact on people's lives and things like that no matter what the mission is sometimes like the profit is kind of the motivation so is that one of those things that you hold as a value that says oh i need to agree with the mission I mean, look, at the end of the day, profit is an important aspect of any business. It's the the cornerstone, the, the, the ultimate, right? So I don't dispute that. You know, I've been working for many organizations where I benefited from good bonuses, you know, incentives, profit incentives. As long as that comes with a fair amount of uh, good governance, as long as that's coupled with the right behaviors, with the right risk culture, with the right tone from the top, you know, and the right values, I think it's a good mix because it's those companies that are for-profit organizations that can, you know, they say you've got to be able to fill your cup to be able to do and help others. And so it's a necessary mix that's needed for society as a whole. I'm glad to hear you say that. And great question, Lucas. The reason I've unsuccessfully retired twice and I'm in my third career is I realized through my strengths that creating jobs was part of my life's mission and my give back. I was just sitting here yesterday with a new hire. This is her not first job ever, but she's been a stay at home mother for her entire life and now entering the workforce. And so Right, all of this is so brand new, and in America we say drinking from a fire hose. You're consuming so much information; it's just overload. And she said, "Now that you've given me permission to ask questions," and I thought, "Wow, I've never really thought I had to say that out loud." But it just changed the whole dynamic. And so, going back to your the heart and soul of your identity, and as a, a leader, being explicit about this is okay. We do encourage you to speak and ask questions and and be authentic. You mentioned one of my favorite words. You said early on in your comments, I'm driven. I love that. As you know, it's one of the characteristics that we talk about a lot. Tell us about being driven, but also being purposeful in your mission. Yeah, I'm an extremely driven person. (laughs) So, um, and I think partly because of my background, you know, when you stem from humble beginnings and when you're driven by hunger, 
right? You go all out. So I think that's sort of been my driving force, you know, behind me. Working in organizations, I think a lot of organizations benefited from my drive, <laughs> Because whether when you are project driven, when you've got a particular task, I'm very task orientated. You know, a lot of my roles over the years, Australia in the last ten years have gone through quite a big shift in the financial services industry because there were a lot of conduct issues, governance issues, at least in the last ten years through the regulators. Some of the biggest fines in corporate history. One of the organisations that I worked for had a 1.3 billion fine for financial crime, you know, compliance issues. And that's a lot of money. That's just the fine. And, in, you know, to fix it costs another few billion and uh, probably, you know, all the class action suits that came off that as well. So as part of my experience in life, I've had these tasks and these actions that were needed to be completed. And that was where I was able to demonstrate that drive. You know, the actionable tasks were quite clear. They were driven by regulatory obligations and commitments, a concept called enforcement enforcement action or enforceable undertakings. So I would say from my perspective, you know, that drive helped those organizations through me. And yeah, I suppose drive and being driven is different for each person. For me, you know, there's a couple of things and my house of leadership, work, family, self, right, comes first. Uh, well, family and self comes first before work. So I'm driven by the first two things, right? I've got to make sure that is well taken care of. And I'm also driven by the purpose that I need to fulfill to help people. So through the board directorships that I'm on at the moment, my drive and my advocacy and support for people that need my help, it's channeled through those uh, avenues as well. So, you know, drive and being driven is really, you know, different to each person based on their needs and where they are in their lives, right? So 10 years ago, I couldn't do not-for-profit work. I just couldn't because we were not in a state or in a position to be able to do that. Now I'm in a position, you know, because I've gone through a journey, I've got a good balance, you know, I can create that balance where I can do a bit of both. I can take risks. I can, you know, support people that need, you know, need my help. I've got skill to offer. So I'm out there, you know, providing advice, governance services, I write policies, you know, I do compliance assessments for pretty big not-for-profit organizations who are very grateful for the work that I do. To bring our friend Helen into the conversation one more time, she asked me one afternoon, what does capital mean to you? And we were talking about many kinds of capital, but this was fiscal capital. And without even thinking, I said, freedom. By having the drive to create financial freedom, I now can focus on family and self. You know, Looking back across 40 odd years of doing this, my greatest joys come from the family and self. But the work created the opportunity. Lucas and I just spent the weekend in a mountain cabin, had 18 of us there, the entire family for the first time in several years. And if you don't have the capital to, to set aside the time and the travel associated, you don't get to enjoy that family and self. So I think it all works together so seamlessly. So first of all, um, I'm really interested in... Um he used the word guru with uh, Nelson Mandela, and I wanted to have a few details on what that means and how it's distinct from, you know, a teacher or a mentor. And then also, what lesson should all of us or, you know, the corporate world be learning from Nelson Mandela? Wow. Where do I start? I suppose, you know, I think for me, it's the sacrifices that he made. For somebody for 27 years of his life, to choose to be in solitary, you know, confinement in, in prison, to help millions of people, to free millions of people, what more can I say, <laughs> right? So I think it's, you know, being selfless, standing up for what's right. There's so many, you know, quotes, but one quote that resonates uh, very well with me is, it always seems impossible until it's done. 
right? That's a famous quote, Nelson Mandela quote. And that's something I always put forward, whether it's to my family, my children, you know, the teams that I've had reporting into me, my leaders. I suppose that's the, the biggest takeaway from that experience, right? He freed 60 million people or maybe 50 million people. You know, 10 million people probably had the right, or 4 million people had the right to vote and the right of freedom, and 55 million people didn't, right? So I suppose just staying the course, I'm not saying everyone should do 27 years in prison, but, uh, you know, he, he lost a lot. He lost his family. He lost time with his family, right? But the day when I went to go and uh, vote for the very first time with my 65-year-old dad, who for the very first time went, you know, to go and vote at the voting polls, I can tell you one thing. It was just an experience. Never, like, there's nothing that can take away that experience, right? The experience of freedom. So one of the themes that we teach is this idea of self-selection. Not waiting for the world to say, Dinesh, go into being a non-executive director. Dinesh, go into coaching. But you as an individual saying, I'm going to go, I have a vision. I'm just going to go make it happen. I think as a leader and as a coach trainer, that self-selection is gigantic to personal success. However you might define that. If you want to run for office or you want to become a non-executive director, you want to become a coach, just go do it. It sounds like that's a theme of yours as well, implicitly or explicitly. Yes, no, absolutely. Look, I've always been the black sheep in the family. You know, I've always been somebody that did something that was really different compared to everyone else. And for me, I don't operate within the confines. You know, people still think I'm crazy. Like my family think what I'm trying to do and this vision of mine, wanting to be a coach, I'm wanting to, you know, run a risk consultancy. I want to do a board portfolio and I'm going to do it. Like I'm going to get onto, you know, lots of different boards. I'm getting onto my fourth board in a year. I've just, I didn't think I'll have one board in one year. I've just been offered the fourth board. I'm earning money. I mean, I think for me, the concept, and I've learned from my coach, our common um, associate, it's the principles of imagine, discover, and become. You know, it's about just sitting down, you know, a journaling. It's things I learned from the last boot camp, and everything kind of worked very well for me. You know, I engaged Helen. She introduced me to you. I went on the uh, last year, October, I had the... Um, you know, the boot camp, the 30 hour boot camp. It was incredible that whole journey because it helped me. It was just about taking the next step and the next step, just iterative steps, you know, and it doesn't matter at the end of the day, you know, success is not about getting to a point. Success is about trying, making small steps and progress. And for me, that's enough. It's all you need, really. So the other day, um, I was with all my siblings. We were staying in a cabin together and we were all together for the first time in a while. And we went on this really challenging hike and I was, I was surprised like how everybody powered through it and, and everybody was very physically capable. And I was thinking, well, they must have been, you know, working out all this time and I'm not thinking about it. They're, they're practicing and getting ready for this. And so my question is, what are you kind of working on in your self and family time that maybe people would be surprised about? It? And if so, if it does affect your work, in what ways does it? Yeah, so that's I have this vision board, and on this vision board, I've got a few different things. But you know, in the center of it is my uh, family and myself. And for me, spirituality. I suppose it's not profound. It's just, you know, everyone has some level of spirituality. But for me, it's just bringing it back home. You know, when you're busy, like, yeah, I've just really focused on my career. Not that I didn't focus on spirituality, but it was just something that I did when I had, a, had time. Whereas I wanted to shift that around and focus my life around my spirituality, right? And then everything else should come around, you know, fall 
around that. So that's where, you know, that's been my change, you know, my focus in my life. I was a driver, like I drove the kids when it came to, you know, you know, my son being an engineer, my daughter being a lawyer, that you got to study, you got to, you know, be the top, you know, in the class, that sort of thing. Even myself, I've like reassessed all of that and said, right, we need to rein it back in. What's important at the end of the day, right? And for me, at the end of the day, it's spirituality that reminds us of our values, that keeps us focused and centered, right? So that is really the biggest uh, focus for me. Awesome. Well, I'm glad we got to get that point in there. It's good to hear as a parent. (laughs) Well, that concludes this episode of Building a Coaching Culture. I truly hope that this episode was helpful to you. If it was, be sure to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Maybe stop and give us a rating or review and share this podcast with someone who might find it helpful as well. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time.